In this episode of Data Framed, a Data Camp podcast, I'll be speaking with Sebastian Rajka, a machine learning aficionado, data analyst, author, Python programmer, open source contributor, computational biologist, and occasional blogger. Sebastian has also recently accepted a position as Assistant Professor of Statistics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison starting this summer. Congrats, Sebastian, and congrats to the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Today, Sebastian and I will be talking about the role of data science in modern biology and the power of deep learning in today's rapidly evolving data science landscape. How is Sebastian using deep learning to build facial recognition software that also prevents racial and gender profiling? Stick around to find out. I'm Hugo Bound Anderson, a data scientist at DataCamp, and this is DataFrame. Welcome to DataFrame, a weekly data camp podcast exploring what data science looks like on the ground for working data scientists and what problems it can solve. I'm your host, Hugo Bound Anderson. You can follow me on Twitter at Hugo Bound and DataCamp at DataCamp. You can find all our episodes and show notes at datacamp.com slash community slash podcast. Hi, Sebastian, and welcome to Data Framed. Yeah, hi, Hugo. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm wondering what questions you have for me, and uh, I'm happy to talk about everything you like. Fantastic. And I've got so many, so many questions for you, and I, I'm really excited to have a general conversation about, about data science, about data science in biology, machine learning, deep learning, the Python ecosystem, all of these things. But before all of that, I want to find out a bit about you. What are you known for in, in the data science community? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, before we dive into the many topics you just mentioned, I think yeah, we can cover maybe or we can record an audiobook almost uh, if we want to cover everything. So, yeah, what I am known for. So I started blogging. I think it was the beginning of the grad school. It was usually in the evening hours after eight hours of research during my PhD. And I wrote the articles on uh, R and principal component analysis in Python. And that's maybe how it started. And then at some point I signed up at Twitter and I started tweeting and people started following me and we had interesting back and forth on Twitter. And um, yeah, somehow I got hooked into this social media thing. And that's maybe how people know me these days. Uh, when I go to conferences, people say, hey, I know you from Twitter <laughs> and stuff like that. But all of your work here actually led to you writing more and writing a book, in fact, right? Yes, the publisher contacted me. I think it was probably based on uh, my blogs. And they said, hey, you know about machine learning and Python, and would you like to write a book? Somehow that was kind of appealing to me because writing blogs is nice, but then I thought, okay, I have so many connected topics, and if I could put them into one kind of storyline, that would make sense. Yeah, but honestly, I saw that they already had so many books out there on machine learning and Python uh, that was the publisher packed. And I declined the offer. But then I uh, talked to some friends and my friend said, hey, that would be a nice thing to do. I like your stuff and your tutorials. You should definitely write a book and blah, blah. <laughs> and so, yeah, then I kind of reconsidered, uh, emailed the publisher, hey, you know, I said I wasn't interested, but somehow I changed my mind. And would you still be uh, willing to have me as, as an author on the book? And yeah, that's how I wrote the book. And it's called Python machine learning, and it's in its second edition now, right? Yeah, so uh, last year they uh, contacted me, hey, uh, we would like to update the book. It's uh, People like it, and it's so useful to people, and we wanted to have some additional chapters on TensorFlow and uh, things like that, and we were developing these methods for biometrics also based on TensorFlow, and then we thought, okay, we can maybe have some chapters on TensorFlow, and then we partnered up and with Vahid. Fantastic. And in parallel with all of this, you've also been highly involved in the open source community, right? Yeah, that is one thing. So I write a lot uh, during my work, and I code a lot during my work, but somehow when I get home and sometimes I feel like I need to do more coding. I mean, <laughs> so I, I'm pretty active on GitHub. Uh, so I have my own like open source packages. So for example, I think one, I don't know when I started it. It might be 2014. It's this ML extend package. And for that one, I was, I'm also contributing to uh, scikit-learn sometimes. And sometimes though, I have to implement algorithms that related to machine learning or data science in general that I can't find anywhere else. For example, ensemble methods, the voting classifier, 
which is also ported now to scikit-learn though, but the stacking classifiers, and there's a stacking classifier for, uh, with uh, cross-validation, which is very popular on Kaggle, Kaggle, I think, because I get uh, many emails with questions and uh, tips, if I have tips for them, because they a lot of people use that in Kaggle competitions. And yeah, that is about machine learning, but uh, yeah, I also do a lot of biology stuff. So one other package maybe would be BioPandas. Uh, that's a very simple package that reads uh, protein structure files and or let's say just files of mole molecules into a pandas data frame so the coordinates and atom specifiers and here the goal is so in biology we have all these different tools and every tool has an api to parse these files and it's pretty confusing you have to kind of relearn an api like a almost like a learning a programming language to deal with these files and I thought, why don't we just use pandas? Because everyone knows pandas and it has a very powerful selection syntax. And you can do a lot of things in pandas that you usually also do. So you don't have to relearn all the commands and stuff. I'm always happy to uh, contribute to the community to make stack of tools that we have even better if I can. I like the idea and the philosophy behind BioPandas, the, the idea of actually taking, I mean, a lot of work has been put into Pandas um, and there's a lot of machinery there and leveraging that for other uh, other disciplines, which it wasn't necessarily created for and opening, you know, the world of biologists and people thinking about our pr protein structure and molecules in that sense to be able to leverage Pandas is, is incredibly cool. Yeah, it really, I mean, it is, this is very efficient, and also on the other hand, if you don't know pandas, you may, that may be encouraging you to learn pandas, and then you can you know, use pandas for all kinds of things. Or the other way around, there's a high chance that you already know pandas, so you save a lot of time, and you know that the things you're doing are working because pandas, I mean, has been developed for I don't know five years, seven years. It's pretty robust. There are not many bugs uh, compared to a quick re-implementation re for a certain project and things like that. Yeah, and what it means is people aren't reinventing the wheel and that software development isn't happening in, in discipline silos as, as well, which, which is incredibly important. How did you get into data science originally? What's the backstory here? Huh, so, yeah, I, I mentioned my blog. So I was blogging and I think, but before I started blogging, I was a biologist and at some point I was becoming a purely computational biologist and I needed to do, analyze a lot of data. And I got into R because R was popular back then. It might have been 2010, 2011. And so I did a lot of R and there's also a small, a very small book I wrote. It was called Heat Maps in R. But the problem in computational biology is you often have to collect your data yourself from certain sources. And R is not really great at that. I mean, R is a great tool for analysis, but if you have to do some custom stuff, if you have to write some code that grabs some data here, cleans it up, merges it with something else, or all the processing stuff, yeah, that is uh, usually not that convenient in uh, R. So I picked up Python. Uh, I was using Perl before, but uh, somehow... I needed to use a package that was in Python. I saw the language and it clicked with me. So I was doing Python and R and doing some very basic data analysis. But yeah, that was usually not enough. So I, I was pretty good at coding, but I was a little bit lacking the, I would say, the methods for doing predictions and statistical modeling and things like that. So there was a great class at MSU uh, taught by Aaron Ross. Uh, he's, uh, he was back then a new professor. He just joined. It was the first semester he taught the class, a CSE 802 statistical pattern recognition, if I remember correctly, was, was I think, was six, seven years ago. So what I liked about this was it was... Uh, mostly based on base statistics, uh, pattern recognition using base classifiers. That is maybe how I got into this data science, machine learning stuff. So I was so excited about this class that I did a lot of reading, a lot of studying on my own and started applying these techniques to my projects and uh, took other classes and I had my own little side projects. Uh, there was one, I think it's also maybe already four or five years ago, the Music Mute, a moot project where I tried to predict... Uh, the mood of music, music of songs based on their song texts. And I did a lot of like hobby projects in data science that got me really excited. And at the same time, I learned something that I could use for my 
research projects. And yeah, maybe that's that's how I got into data science. That's that's fantastic because a lot of budding data scientists at, at Data Camp and elsewhere uh, ask me how to get into to, to data science. Uh, should they learn Python or should they learn R or SQL or whatever it may be? And I my response always is don't worry about the technology yet mm -hmm. find some questions you're interested in and and figure out what tools you'll need to to answer those and that i think your your backstory really speaks to that that every tool you picked up in in that version of your story and in, in any way you picked up in order to solve either bi biological problems or hobby projects you you're interested in very much motivated from a from a practical point of view and i think that's you know one of the best ways to learn right yeah i mean uh tools uh, honestly they are useful also but they come and go, you know, it's like a tool is a tool. I mean, ultimately, it's about the problems you want to address or things that you are really excited about, or projects that you want to tackle or problems you want to solve. And tools help with that. But it's I think it's not very motivating to start a class and learn about a tool because then you you don't have any maybe motivation to use it or you don't know why you want to use it. Getting into data science by having a passion for solving problems. That is maybe the, the most important thing. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And so that's why we're here to talk about data science in, in biology, right? So before we dive in to this intersection of, of data science and, and biology, I'd like to step back a bit and just talk about biology in, in, in general, in terms of what some major questions in biology are and what, what are your research interests? What do, you, what do you really like to think about? What, what keeps you ticking? Um, so yeah, so biology. I mean, if you ask me about biology, there are so many, many, many different project uh, problems in biology that need to be solved in so many different fields. It's it's not so simple. So that we have a lot of things going on in biology. And just to give you maybe a quick overview to before I tell you more about my stuff. So in biology, we have like, oh, what can I? I mean, Titus Brown, for example, he, uh, was on my committee. Uh, he was uh, working mainly, or he's working mainly on genome analysis, assembling genomes. Uh, I'm not sure if you heard of, uh, you probably are familiar with DNA. Yeah. Um, that is uh, the code that in our body that is uh, responsible for generating everything like the cells and the proteins and things like that. And a lot of people in, uh, I would call that field maybe bioinformatics, a lot of people ask questions and address problems based on DNA. They uh, analyze genes. Genes are like the functional units that encode something. Looking at them, for example, uh, detecting early diseases or biomarkers for certain diseases. And even, I mean, like sequencing a genome, they sequence that in little chunks. And somehow you have to assemble these chunks. That would be one uh, very, uh, challenge, I mean, a challenging and interesting problem area because that is becoming more and more affordable. And if people, let's say, can get their hands on these data sets, I mean, you can, I think, sequence your genome for 200 bucks or something now. I mean, there are a lot of uh, interesting questions to address there based on the genome level. Or you have the whole um, microbiology community, like people who work with bacteria, like uh, taking soil samples, uh, looking at uh, certain properties of the environment and things like that, or looking at metabolites and uh, little uh, markers in the environment for certain things, or the, the zoologists and plant biologists, for example. I had a friend from soccer. He, he, that's a kind of funny thing. They call it the hyena lab. So they study the behavior of hyenas, and uh, grad students get sent to Africa for like a year or something, wow. which I think is very exciting. And so they get to be outside more than other grad students, I think, <laughs> a little bit of sunshine. And yeah, so the, their stuff is also really connected to data science in terms of, they use a lot of statistics, like um, basically, or mainly Bayesian uh, statistics. And so it's not only, I mean, if you say, okay, uh, the person is mainly observing uh, animals' behavior, it doesn't mean it stops with the observation. You have to analyze your data. You have to draw conclusions. It's I think it's all data science uh, in, in a sense. And... Um, so, but what I'm mostly doing is uh, things related to protein structure modeling and drug discovery. So maybe to explain what a protein is, uh, I'm not sure how many listeners uh, heard of proteins. I mean, most of the people who are listening to this podcast right now probably uh, know proteins from uh, the nutrition facts. Exactly. On food. Not necessarily <laughs> in the biological or molecular sense. Protein, uh, to summarize what a protein is, it's uh, a blob in your cell that has a certain function, and it's made up uh, of 
it's called amino acids. So we have 20 different amino acids in the human body. And each uh, amino acid is basically a small molecule that is composed, of course, of atoms. So I would say, uh, top of my head, uh, amino acids, I mean, there are 20 different ones. They are composed of 10 to 30 atoms. And if you connect these amino acids, you get a string of amino acids. And if you fold the string up, you get a protein. But if it's, uh, it's only functional if it's correctly folded. And this is a big challenge in biology. If you have the sequence of amino acids, how they are connected, how to predict how it would fold, because then you can study the function of proteins and the analysis of diseases. You can understand what's wrong with a certain protein and why. what does it do in the body. So protein folding is maybe the most challenging field in biophysics, I would say. Yeah, and, and, and proteins are responsible for so many things, right? Like yeah. transporting molecules, re response, replicating DNA, all, all of this type of stuff. Yeah, right? exactly. So DNA is basically just the code that gets translated into proteins, the, which are the functional units. So you have a code, like a letter code, and this letter code, there is a machinery which itself is a protein machinery. So it's kind of a chicken-egg problem, what was there first, right? But uh, this machinery translates the code into other proteins that have a certain function in your body. It could be receiving signals, like our eyes, they receive a signal, light signal. It's all everywhere proteins are involved, or cells a transporter protein to transport let's say sugar into your cells or break down sugars and i mean it's it's basically the functional the functional units of our body i mean maybe a good example would be think of uh dna as if you are a coder think of it as c code uh, you're writing some code and then you compile it into a program and the compiled program that would be maybe your protein. And if you have a lot of these compiled programs, each has a different function. You have a in uh, Linux, you have the grep function, you have the find function, you have I don't know, you have so many different functions. And and if you put them all together, all the different functions and little programs, you get maybe your cell or your your human body and things like that. So the functional units are like this little Linux Linux or Unix programs, the command line tools and things like that. These would be your little functional units, the proteins. My job was mainly working on problems that involve uh, proteins, but proteins, they have so many different functions and many of, pro of the proteins bind to small molecules. The small molecules kind of regulate these uh, proteins. You can think of it, you have a lock and a key and Proteins are usually very specific. They only bind a certain small molecule. And if this small molecule binds, it has a certain function. And for example, it could be, there's a, I think it's cyclooxygenase molecule involved, I think, in inflammation and things like that. And there's a certain signaling mo molecule in your body that uh, does something with it. But we can also develop drugs that can bind to these uh, proteins to either overactivate it or block it. And for example, aspirin would be a common one where you have a small molecule and the small molecule, if it blocks to this protein, it inhibits the function, then it, the headaches go away, for example. And as you can imagine, I mean, there's there are a lot of use cases for, let's say, drug discovery. And so what we were mainly working on, or what I was mainly working on, was uh, related to the understanding how proteins and small molecules bind, how we can predict how they bind, because that is your basis for finding drugs, for example. We'll jump right back into our interview with Sebastian after a short segment. Now it's time for a segment called Data Science Buzzwords with DataCamp curriculum lead, Spencer Boucher. What have you got for us today, Spencer? Today we're going deep on deep learning, one of everybody's favorite data science buzzwords. Everybody's doing it, or at least they claim to be doing it. What exactly is deep learning, Spencer? Well, in a certain sense, Hugo, the answer to this one's pretty easy. Deep learning is neural networks. That begs the question, though, what's a neural network? So a neural network is just one type of machine learning model that maps a set of inputs to a set of outputs, just like any other. They get their cool name because they're loosely inspired by the way that human brains work as a network of neurons arranged into connected layers. A particular input from one layer will either activate or deactivate the neurons in the next layer. If you're familiar with logistic regression, you can imagine a neural network as just a bunch of logistic regressions stacked on top of one another. 
So where's the deep part come in? Ah, so one of the most well-known papers referencing deep learning is Jeffrey Hinton's Learning Multiple Layers of Representation, which was published in 2007. Hinton was literally just referring to the geometric deepness of a particular class of neural network. A lot of the cool advancements in machine learning since then, like convolutional neural networks and recurrent neural networks, they've essentially boiled down to strategies for setting up the geometry of the neurons in a neural network. And because they all tend to involve many, many layers, the phrase deep learning has stuck. These etymological waters, they've been muddied a little bit in recent years, though, because popular implementations of neural networks, like word to vec for example, are often referred to as deep learning, even though they actually only consist of two layers of neurons. It's honestly up to you whether you want to be a stickler for the term or play it a little more loosey-goosey. So why are people so excited? Mostly just because you can do so many impressively cool things with them. One of the first big waves that deep learning made in popular culture came as far back as 2012, when a classifier was trained to recognize faces and cats from YouTube videos, even without having any label data on either faces or cats. Right now, neural networks, are, they're still at the bleeding edge of our coolest technological breakthroughs. They can generate descriptive captions for images from scratch. They can understand human languages, both written and spoken, and even translate them back and forth. And these days, they can even drive your car. Uh, actually, some modern versions of deep learning are Turing complete, which means that they're really starting to look more like a programming language than any simple mathematical model. So it's all sunshine and roses then? Well, even a tool as powerful as deep learning comes with a set of downsides, of course. For one thing, they generally require a lot of data, which isn't always available or very cheap to collect, as you know, Hugo. Plus, the incredible complexity that powers a deep neural network also makes it really difficult to understand. It can be hard to determine exactly why a neural network is working at all, or the reasons that it may have made a particular decision, although progress is being made in the interpretation department, slowly but surely. For applications that require transparency and understanding, though, you're often still better off with a more interpretable algorithm, like a tree-based method. Thanks for helping to demystify deep learning for us, Spencer. Listeners, if you want to find out more about deep learning, make sure to check out next week's episode with Michelle Gill, a deep learning expert at NVIDIA, an artificial intelligence company that builds GPUs, the processes that everybody uses for deep learning. After that interlude, it's time to jump back into our chat with Sebastian Rajka. It'd be nice to know what type of role data science actually plays in, in these challenges for you. Yeah, so uh, yeah, a good project maybe would be, uh, well, it was a large-scale uh, statistical analysis of uh, different properties of proteins and their small molecules um, that are interacting with them. And what was kind of interesting, I mean, people are studying these protein small molecule interactions for, I don't know, 50 years, 100 years, or at least like the whole last century. And we were taking a data set uh, of non-homologous proteins. That means they were all kind of different. They looked different. They were not just duplicates or very similar proteins. And a whole set of different molecules, small molecules that were bound to them. So they knew uh, we had the data set from a database where they crystallized them. So we, um, people know the 3D coordinates of how they are bound of both of the structures. And then we analyzed how they interact with each other. And for that, we uh, brought a tool to assign, uh, it's called hydrogen bonds, a bond between an atom on the small molecule and the protein. And in order to do that, we had to implement uh, a lot of rules like uh, geometric constraints, distance con constraints. So it was a lot of coding. That's where the coding part came in. But then we uh, assigned all these hydrogen bonds to our data, and then we wanted to analyze them to find trends. And what we found, I mean, it's, it sounds very simple, but it's actually a big thing. So that uh, ligands, uh, they, there are two types of atoms, like acceptor atoms and donor atoms for hydrogen bonds. We found that ligands, on average, have twice as many acceptor atoms than uh, proteins, so twice as many acceptors than donors. So there's a high bias in this uh, kind of interaction. And that has, I think, very important implications for drug discovery. If you are designing, for example, ligands, you may want to design ligands in a way or small molecules in a way that they have more acceptors because it's maybe more favorable. 
And also when we looked uh, at the statistics and the ge geometry, acceptor atoms, they have a wider range where they can accept hydrogen bonds. And donor atoms have a very, I would say, narrow range. And if one thinks about this, I mean, this is where maybe the data science, the problem solving, the thinking, the questions come in. So if you have a very narrow range, it makes you more specific to something. And if a protein has a very, very narrow range of accepting hydrogen bonds, so proteins have mostly donors, and if the donors are more geometrically constrained, then one might argue maybe that has to do something with this to make proteins more specific for small molecules, because we have a lot of small molecules in an, our environment or in our cells. We just don't want our proteins to bind to all kinds of things. So to make them more specific, that nothing gets out of order in our cells, that it only binds to things that it is supposed to bind to. And uh, I mean, a very um, one might say a very simple analysis, but we sliced and diced the, uh, the data sets by atom types and things like that. But yeah, I would say there was a lot of data science uh, application behind it, all the statistics. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, seeing that the impact on the ground in, involves, you know, drug discovery is in incredibly important and seeing that statistics plays a role in that when you're discussing protein and small molecule interactions, graph theory, as, as you said, plays pl plays a role there. A, a lot of computational algorithms needed to be implemented. Was there any machine learning that, that you used for this type of stuff? Yeah, so machine learning. It was one project uh, where it was particularly useful. It was not about drug discovery, but very related to that. So drug discovery is usually more like a later stage where you find, let's say, a small molecule that inhibits or activates a protein. And then if it goes to uh, clinical trials, uh, let's say involving humans, then you, you speak maybe of more like the real drug discovery part. But in early stages of drug discovery and inhibitor discovery, what you do is you want to find uh, candidates that are to be tested in a lab or experimental assays. And in this project, it was not about a drug, but a small molecule that influences the mating behavior of certain fish in uh, the Great Lakes. That sounds maybe funny, but there's a right. species in the Great Lakes and it is very harmful for the environment because uh, these fish are predators of other fish and the uh, native fish. And the native fish, basically the populations, they decrease. This fish population increases. It's bad for the fishery. And then the fishery or people try to get rid of this problem by uh, having small toxic molecules in the lake that kills the larvae of that fish. But then also it affects other fishes again. And so we thought about an environmentally friendly approach. What's kind of interesting about this fish is... Uh, the sea lamprey, what it, is, what it does, it's the female fish are swimming, or the male fishes, sorry, are swimming to a small river or to rivers attached to the Great Lakes, and they build nests. And once they are done with the nest building, they secrete pheromones, which attract the female fish from the lake to the nesting sites. And then they have like little babies, little sea lampreys. And we thought if we can uh, prevent the females from smelling this pheromone in the water, then they might not swim to the nesting areas. So we wanted to find a molecule. And of course, <laughs> like always, there's a protein involved, a protein that binds to this uh, pheromone and that uh, causes in the brain the signaling pathway. It is uh, Then our, our goal was basically to find a molecule that also binds to this protein, but instead of activating it, blocking it. So occupying this binding site so that the real pheromone can't bind. So the question now was, okay, where do we start? <laughs> so yeah, what I did is, or where I started was, uh, there's a database out there. They have 12 million commercially available molecules, the three, three structures of it. Okay, that is maybe a starting point, but our uh, collaborators, they are experimentalists in uh, zoology and they do all the experiments, very hard work. And although they work almost, I would say 20 hours a day or something, Based on what I've seen, based on their results, they must be very busy, but they can't test 12 million molecules. So my part here was to narrow it down to, let's say, uh, I think in the end we had 299 uh, molecules that we ordered and tested for one uh, iteration of this project. And you want to find molecules that work. Uh, at first, you just screen them, you find uh, similarities, you've tried to, you have a model, a computational model of your protein, you want to see if it is potentially fitting into the binding pocket of this computational model. 
you want to compare it to the real pheromone to have something that is similar because then you think, okay, if it's similar, it might have the same effect, but it doesn't tell you if it's activating or inhibiting it. And once we got uh, some results, though, from our collaborators, once they tested a bunch of molecules, we could use machine learning to see or to predict to first to deduce what's important, what makes the molecules active, what do all the active molecules have in common. And what were the features or what, what type of features were you using to predict? So good, good question. Here, uh, what features I focused on was just the atoms themselves. So I, over, I had the real pheromone and I overlaid my molecules with a real pheromone in the way that they would are predicted to bind to the protein. And then I could see, okay, what do they have in common? What kind of atom types do they have in common at certain positions? So my features were just the atom types, the the position of the atoms and what kind of atom it is. If it is, uh, let's say, an oxygen, a nitrogen atom, because, uh, for example, an OH group and a hydroxy group, it's an oxygen with a hydrogen that can accept or donate a hydrogen bond that can make two different kinds of interactions. Or we had a negatively charged um, sulfur atom at one end, which turned out to be the most important part for binding or for triggering the signaling pathway. In the end, were you able to predict it quite well? So, yeah, we found a molecule that blocks in the uh, experimental assays where they put electrodes into the brain of the fish and measure the electric signal. Uh, one molecule was, for instance, able to block it by 92%, so almost completely, the uh, signaling by the pheromone. I have to honestly say what they do right now. It works, so it kills the larvae. It has some uh, bad environmental effects. It's not that bad if you use the molecule in a right concentration. It's not too toxic, but it's always good to have a, let's say, environmentally friendly uh, approach and also a kind of alternative approach. Because usually, like you know from ensemble machine learning stuff, it's usually good to combine different things to get even better results, right? Cool, and I'm really excited to see see what happens next with this. So we've discussed, uh, Sebastian, applications of machine learning in, in, in biology. Uh, I noticed on the back of your uh, Python machine learning book, it, it actually says machine learning is eating the software world. And now deep learning is extending machine learning. And I know how passionate you are about deep learning. And in fact, that you've started writing a new book on, on artificial neural networks. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk about the, the impact that deep learning has on, on biology or on some of your work. Yeah, so with a deep learning uh, topic, I think, I mean, of course, we have all the hype, but it is really useful. And uh, I think also right now, what is really interesting to see is uh, recently, uh, people started using deep learning for solving certain pro uh, problems in biology. For example, synthesizing new molecules with autoencoders and predicting the toxicity of molecules. And the results looked amazing. I mean, these are, of course... Uh, academic results, how much of that is used in, uh, let's say, outside of academia. And honestly, I also have to admit that my deep learning work is more in biometrics, not biology. So biometrics, that's um, there are two parts of biometrics. There are two interpretations of that. On the government website, for example, they talk about biometrics as something related to biology. But I mean here uh, biometrics related to biometric features, let's say human face recognition and things like that. But before I go to that, maybe we, you can put that in the show notes because I recently <laughs> bumped into Alexander Kalinin. He's uh, in Ann Arbor and he wrote an awesome manuscript. I think it's about 100 pages. It's on BioArchive and it's a review of uh, deep learning in biology. And if someone is interested, I think that is maybe the starting point or to see what uh, deep learning, what impact it has on biology. Yeah, so uh, my biometrics projects. So I was uh, recently working on a new neuro neural network architecture. We called it semi-adversarial neural networks. The, the challenge is in biometrics, you have all these great algorithms that can deduce all kinds of features from a face, for example. But uh, the problem is they can also get misused. For example, if you have an image database, you just want to, let's say, detect, okay, uh, you have a database of uh, criminals and you want to just cross-reference, let's say you have a camera at the airport and you want to see, okay, is this person in my database? Uh, so you collect data, you have images or you have different image databases. So, but I mean, it's not intended, but what might happen is people can misuse the data sets. They can do a profiling, a gender profiling, for example, or by age or things like that. 
And we were trying to kind of find a method to prevent that. So I had this idea of using an autoencoder. Our semi-adversarial neural network, our goal here was to change a face image, if you have a face image, in a way that a classifier can't predict the gender anymore so that you hide the gender from the face image. But at the same time, the image should still be useful to a face matcher. Let's say you want to identify a person. You have, let's say, a database and you want to see if this person is the real person in your database. That should be still possible, but at the same time, you shouldn't be able to use this image for any kind of profiling. Let's say uh, deducing the gender, having statistics about what, let's say if you have an a online, uh, not an online store, a physical store, and you have pictures of your customers, you, you shouldn't do profiling on that or stuff like that because it's like uh, a privacy issue, right? Yeah, well, that's incredibly, I mean, pro profiling, particularly with, with respect to deep learning and machine learning algorithms is going to become a, in, increasingly a, a, a greater issue. So this, has, this creates real value immediately. And this work is really exciting because uh, it's something that is... Uh, that can be also used for other things, the semi-adversarial ne neural network structure. So what it basically does, it's a, a dual objective that we want to retain uh, one objective, for example, the face matching, while uh, confounding another, for example, uh, extracts the gender information. And the challenge here was, because deep learning, as you may know, I mean, that's a huge hype, or was a huge hype this year, or not hype, but a big topic last year, uh, the adversarial attacks. So neural networks are super easy to exploit, to fool, to make just very small changes that throw them off completely. But yeah, so for our method, I mentioned, our method should hide the gender information. But the problem then is people can just use a different classifier. They can use traditional computer vision systems. So our method also uh, aims to target all methods, to not only apply to a certain model that comes with our architecture, but if someone has a commercial classifier or some other software that does gender classification, it should also not be able to work on this image anymore. We'll jump right back into our interview with Sebastian after a short segment. Now it's time for a segment called Statistical Pitfalls. I'm here with Michael Bedencourt, applied statistician and one of the core developers of the open source statistical modeling platform, Stan. What's up, Mike? Hugo, today I'd like to talk about when your best just isn't good enough. Well, at least when your best fit isn't good enough. What do you mean by a best fit? Any statistical analysis uses data to learn about a system and then inform decisions about how we interact with that system. For example, we might observe user traffic to learn how users behave and then use that knowledge to determine the optimal user experience that we can present to them in the future. An important step in that process is how we characterize what we've learned. A common approach is the best fit, where we consider only a single configuration of our system that is in some sense most consistent with our data. For example, we might consider only the maximum likelihood or maximum a posteriori estimators in a statistical analysis. A best fit seems like a reasonable way to characterize what we've learned about the system, no? Well, it does have a certain intuitive appeal, and that appeal is definitely promoted by the myriad of statistical packages that prioritize delivery of a best fit result. Unfortunately, finite observations will never give us a complete picture of our system, and utilizing only the best fit will lead us to more fragile decision making. Can you go into that a bit more? Absolutely. The ultimate problem is that the information encoded in our observations will always be limited. For example, the inherent variability of observations obfuscates the system being studied. Moreover, observations are often partial, limited to just a subset of the population of interest or just a short window of a time-dependent phenomenon. Reporting a best fit ignores these limitations and assumes that the observations completely characterize future interactions with our system. Ignoring what we didn't observe leads to poor generalization and ultimately, poor decisions. For example, consider the problem of designing an optimal user experience. Optimizing that user experience to only those behaviors seen in a small study disregards the experience of unobserved users or even observed users whose behaviors may vary in time. These limitations are especially pertinent when we try to scale our user base to new audiences. Additionally, the limitations of a best fit aren't just limited to business applications. Many of us have made the mistake of jumping to conclusions in social circumstances, where we assume someone's motivations from limited information instead of giving them the benefit of the doubt by considering all of their possible motivations. 
So how do we avoid the limitations of a best fit? In order to facilitate robust decision making, we have to consider something with which many of us are inherently uncomfortable, and that's uncertainty. Cognizant of the limitations of a finite observation, we have to be careful not to focus on just the simplest or the easiest explanation for what we've observed. We instead have to consider all of the explanations consistent with our information and devise a response that is compatible with as many of those explanations as possible. We may not be able to exactly infer the behavior of an entire population given just a few observations, or the full time dependence of a system given data in just a short window. But by reporting our uncertainty of the behavior in those circumstances, we give ourselves the best opportunity to succeed. So what's the takeaway here, Mike? When making decisions or communicating the results of an analysis with stakeholders who will make a decision, we have to prioritize uncertainty. (laughs) Instead of focusing on the best fit, we have to consider confidence intervals, posterior distributions, or simply narratives about the range of possible behaviors in our system. It's an uncertain world out there, Hugo, and ignoring that uncertainty will punish you sooner or later. Mike, thanks for that introduction to the statistical pitfall of the best fit. As always, it was my pleasure, and I can say that with certainty. Time to get straight back into our chat with Sebastian Rajka. So with all your work in in, in deep learning uh, for your research, also the software development stuff you do, the books you're writing, you have a lot of insight into the inner workings and the societal impact of deep learning. Where do you see the future of deep learning going? Yeah, so that is, (laughs) wow, Uh, interesting questions. So uh, interesting question. So top of my head, I would say the adversarial attacks that I just mentioned, I think that is an issue if we want. Uh, For certain applications, it's not so important, but... Let's say in biometrics, for example, it's super important that these methods are robust and secure. And I think uh, that is maybe a one focused area where people try to make these methods more robust. And it will, of course, require more work in this area. I think Ian Goodfellow has a website on that and all about adversarial attacks and things like that. That is very important. But um, also I saw a lot of people are now finally ready or I mean, to get more into the, how how do uh, deep learning how, how does deep learning work? How can we interpret our methods? There was I think Jan Le Kuhn had a discussion on Facebook. He started that that people tried now to further understand what deep learning really does. I mean, like beyond the black box thing. I mean, we understand how the algorithms work, but really what our models deduce, what kind of information they deduce, and how. And this speaks to uh, interpretability and and representations Mm -hmm. as well, right? Exactly, exactly. And also, I mean, uh, as I mentioned earlier, deep learning is becoming more popular in biology, and uh, that will hopefully also become more mature, that the ideas get really implemented into real applications that are used more widely, and for example, on Monday, I went to a seminar, was also interesting, where people use deep learning for basically doing the opposite, not uh, extracting features from data, but using uh, features to generate the data. And also, I mean, last year, Hinton's capsule networks, uh, that's something I think will be a hot topic this year, especially. And also, <laughs> there was like this, uh, how did it go? The quote by Hinton where he said, uh, we should throw it all away and start again. With respect to backprop, yeah? Yeah, yeah. And so that is also interesting. Uh, I'm interested to see how that goes. I mean, I think there's some, I mean, of course, a big kernel of truth here. These are all kind of classic methods. But here's also, I think, the distinction between deep learning research or the development of new methods versus applying these methods to solve problems that were currently challenging. I mean, we don't have to, for that, we don't have to necessarily mimic the human brain. It is maybe, I mean, if a logistic regression classifier was enough and did certain good predictions on certain data sets, I mean, the goal here is to make good predictions and not necessarily, let's say, mimicking the brain or having different methods out there that make different kinds of predictions. It's more about, there are two two different goals, I think. And of course, regressions and, and linear models have the added bonus that they're interpretable in, in, in some sense. But yeah, there are also other interesting methods now. I think that what you just said is very interesting. That uh, So yeah, for example, yeah, um, model interpretability is becoming more and more popular now. I mean, for, uh, I think it was about two years ago, they, uh, there was the LIME method, which stands for Local Interpretable Model Agnostic Explanations. So it's an interesting idea where they 
locally approximate the predictions to uh, have a locally faithful model and from that like in a, like in a logistic regression model or a linear regression model you can look at the coefficients and see how each variable com- contributes to the overall prediction and there was also recently a new method uh, i think it was called shap which stands for shapley additive uh, explanations there was an uh, odsc seminar and that is i think the next step which uh, is particularly uh, trying to address the accuracy interpretability trade-off issue and it i think it combines six different methods i think when i looked at it it was uh, they mentioned six different methods lime is one of them that they kind of uh, unify to have an even better method to make up approximations to interpret very difficult uh, models or black box models uh, which are not so easy to interpret in terms of what makes them work and what features do they use to make the prediction Exactly. And I, I think the ability to take black box models and make them somewhat inter- interpretable with a trade-off for uh, accuracy in, in some sense allows us, it gives us so much power in terms of asking the right questions and giving the right answers to a wide array of people who may not know, who may not be technical, right? Mm-hmm. And here, this is also a very important point. Uh, I think in any kind of scenario, there's always uh, something you have to think about. It's do I want to just, do I only care about accuracy or predictive performance or is interpretability important? And there's usually, a, I would say a trade-off, like a, like a kind of a no free lunch theorem. Yeah, there are different kind of objectives. And what is more important to you? That's a very important question to ask. And yeah, with these methods, you basically bring the benefit of having something interpretable to the models that are maybe better performing, but not so interpretable. So it's helping with this kind of trade-off thing. Absolutely. So we've been discussing all types of data science techniques and and methodologies. I'm wondering what's your favorite data science technique or methodology or something you'd love to do or or, or love to use when doing data science? I I like the bootstrap a lot, you know, like the, uh, that you can do more like the simulation uh, to get uh, confidence intervals instead of, memorizing all the formulas and making assumptions about normal distributions so that you just simulate your simulation i think is i like simulation a lot like bootstraps and stuff or the permutation test if you do a hypothesis testing that you don't have to remember okay do i have to do a t-test do i uh have all the assumptions here uh correctly and does my data look okay for this kind of test and blah 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 so i can just simulate it use a permutation test and yeah I would say these are. That's cool. And the great thing about these these tests or these approaches to tests are, you, as you say, you don't have to make in many assumptions or yeah, yeah. have any underlying models. Yeah. or. Yeah, they are non-parametric and don't require any. Uh, I think it's something I think from the data science uh, toolbox that is only now possible because we also have the computational power. And I like that a lot. It's uh, very elegant, I would say. Yeah, me too. And I think for anybody out there who hasn't had much experience with the bootstrap or permutation tests, um, I can definitely recommend uh, a lot of Alan Downey's books, and I'll oh, include mm-hmm. one of those in the show mm-hmm. notes. And also, um, we've got a couple of uh, three courses on DataCamp called Statistical Thinking in, in, in Python courses, which do all the statistical stuff through resampling techniques, which was a lot of fun to create with my collaborator, Justin, Justin Boyce. So we've talked a lot about modern data science in biology, uh, what the deep learning landscape looks like. Currently, what does the future of data science look like to you, Sebastian? Oh, yeah. So I would say the future of data science is, I think, a lot about that is about the community. I think that a lot of people realize uh, that they can benefit from a lot of tools. And uh, yesterday there was a, a tweet that I retweeted, a talk by Titus Brown, and he said, something along the lines of that we should maybe also teach data science from a domain-specific perspective. Instead of just presenting tools and here's the tool, learn the tool, and maybe you can do something with it in your project. I think it's interesting to also introduce people from a domain-specific perspective. So that let's say I have a biology problem and then I throw in some data science techniques to solve a slight particular problem. And I think by that, people, more and more people will discover that data science techniques, compute, uh, a little bit of programming or the use of statistical packages and modeling or a little bit of machine learning will be useful in their work and that more and more people will be um, 
incorporating the tools that we have in their, let's say, everyday life, uh, making it a standard toolbox for every maybe researcher, but also programmers and other people. I think where this is going, I mean, we have the core right now. We have NumPy, we have SciPy, we have Pandas and Scikit-Learn, very mature tools, very powerful tools. And I think the baseline for everything that got developed in the recent years, or not the baseline, but the core, I would say, and everything else, I think, is becoming more and more interesting, but it's built on these things. And we're getting, we are getting really interesting tools like Dask, which uh, parallelizes things uh, like Pandas in parallel, basically, and out-of-core learning or out-of-core computations. And Pandas is also currently being redesigned, uh, Pandas 2, which is making the underlying data structure or data representation more efficient. And there's a lot of improvements in terms of hey, these are the tools that we use to solve different problems, but hey, let's scale that up, make that uh, run faster, more efficiently, and let's uh, improve what we have. But then on the other hand, we have also new methods, uh, new methods that may that take a little bit of a different approach, combine different things. For example, uh, I always mention, uh, it's a really cool tool, uh, Randy Olson's uh, Teapot, which is a really cool idea. So he's taking one of the core packages, Scikit-Learn, and uh, he uses genetic algorithms to evolve an uh, optimal data science pipeline, a uh, machine learning pipeline, which involves not only the hyperparameter tuning, but also feature extraction methods. So, and and this is this is what we're really talking about is is automated machine learning in some exactly. sense. Exactly, right? that is what I was was uh, trying to get at. <laughs> In fact, I'm going to have Randy on the show at some point to talk about automated machine learning. So that's that's going to be very exciting. Oh, that is really cool. No, that I don't want, don't want to take away too much. <laughs> but yeah, that is what I wanted to get at, that machine learning, automating machine learning, uh, not machine learning itself, but the whole data science, uh, maybe pipeline, uh, that it is becoming more accessible, that it is, I would say we, we always will have experts that uh, really focus on that because at some point, I mean, there's so much a machine can do, or you can automate, I think, everything. But sometimes, I mean, it is useful to have experts, but not everyone has to be an expert. Yeah, and it, I think it's important to actually, you know, people are scared. Well, there's, there is a general fear that will data science be automated? And I don't necessarily su subscribe to that. I think we can automate a lot of the stuff, such as hyperparameter tuning and a lot of the machine learning mm -hmm. uh, techniques to free us up to do more enjoyable, creative work as data scientists, right? Yeah, I mean... Maybe uh, it's not the best analogy, but back then uh, when cars were just being invented, everyone who wanted to, let's say, uh, test or drive a car had to build their own car, uh, but just to get from A to B or something like that. But now, I mean, don't everyone has to know how to build a car in order to drive, right? So I think with data science, you automate these tools to make them available. And there will be always, I think there's no reason to be afraid of something because, I mean, it's never about the tools and things like that. It is about the questions you ask and the problems you want to solve. And a, a machine, you can't automate the asking of questions because it is about what you are interested in, what you want to solve, what problem you want to solve. And that is something that involves the hu uh, human. And also, on the other hand, you have the two kind of fields. You have more the applications and you have the research. And the research will never go away. You will always want to improve things and develop new methods. And for the application, why not automating things that are boring, like you said, hyperparameter tuning? Because then the research, uh, the application is mostly focused on addressing the question. If you can address the questions more easily, why should you make your life hard and implement low-level code if you can automate the tedious stuff, right? And you've mentioned so many interesting things in in here one thing so to to paraphrase what what you've said one part of the future of data science looks like all the tools that have already been developed actually spreading through society spreading through a lot of different disciplines to help people answer questions that have yet remained unanswered the next is to build on top of these tools to build kind of the next layer of of data science packages and, and libraries in, in in the open source and then there's the making everything more convenient to automate things so that we can concentrate really on on the really fun stuff. Sebastian, we've come to the end of this this great interview. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you have any final call to action for aspiring and well-seasoned well, well -seasoned data scientists out there. What would you like the, to see the community do to charge forward? Just making tools more uh, available in data science. If you develop something that you think is useful to others, to share that. And uh, also, uh, I think we need to get better a little bit at rewarding open source efforts. And 
I think that it would be nice to have like a reward system in academia that it is not only about uh, how much um, papers you get out, but also how you contribute to society, like what, how how useful your tools are for helping others. Because it's not only about your results, it's sometimes, or it's very, very, very often the tool that allows others to do their research. And the tool is often also research itself. I, I, I agree completely. And, and, and I think the incentives, of course, need to become far more uh, uh, aligned so that open source software development and actually developing tools for working research scientists is is rewarded in an academic setting in a way that it isn't quite yet but hopefully we'll see that in in, in the coming years mm -hmm. yeah and uh i talked so much about academia right now so maybe from an industry perspective what industry can do is i think yeah, a lot of uh, the tools of course there are sponsors and things like that but um and a lot of these tools that we use, we use for free. And also a lot of industry folks are using software, open source software for free. And it would be just nice if if it's possible for the company to kind of sponsor those projects to allow people to kind of reward people who are working. on It's mostly a free time effort, but there are maybe in future some more full-time employees that help developing open source software because, I mean, there's only so much you can do in your free time. And... The thing is, it would be really nice if more companies, for example, would, let's say, sponsor or fund uh, things like that, open source software that they use themselves, that they find useful. And for example, like PyPy was, for example, industry funded. And it's uh, right now, I think, funded by a new grant from the Mozilla Open Source Software Support. And this is super nice. And I think if industry could do a little bit more in supporting open source software, that would be another great uh, call to make. Yeah, it would be great to see it be a very strong, established part of the culture. Sebastian, it's been such a pleasure having you on the show. I enjoyed it a lot. Fantastic, as did I. Thanks for joining our conversation with Sebastian about the role of data science in modern biology and the power of deep learning in today's rapidly evolving data science landscape. We saw how integral data science and open source software development are to modern biology, from genomics to ecology and biophysics to researching protein structures and the implications in drug discovery. Sebastian also showed us the importance of deep learning and his semi-adversarial neural networks in building algorithms that can identify faces from databases and simultaneously obfuscate forms of profiling, such as racial and gender profiling. Make sure to check out our next episode, a conversation with Michelle Gill, a deep learning expert at NVIDIA an artificial intelligence company that builds GPUs, the processes that everybody uses for deep learning. We'll talk specifically about the modern superpower of deep learning and where it has the largest impact, past, present, and future, filtered through the lens of Michelle's work at NVIDIA. I'm your host, Hugo Bound Anderson. You can follow me on Twitter at Hugo Bound and Datacamp at Datacamp. You can find all our episodes and show notes at datacamp.com slash community slash podcast.